Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. All right. Today we're continuing our Compute Ontario colloquium series. Uh, my name is Eric Spence. I'm one of the analysts at SINET, the High Performance Computing Consortium at the University of Toronto. And today I'll be uh, giving a little chat on a comparison of neural network frameworks that I uh, did recently. For those of you that want to follow along, you can find the slides at this link. This is at the SINET Education website. That link will uh, send you to the class and you can get the slides there if you want to follow along. All right, so um, before we get started, I just want to give a little motivation for this um, comparison that I'm, go I'm going to be presenting today. So I have been programming neural network frameworks for a number of years now. And when I got into neural networks, uh, TensorFlow was the neural network framework that you wanted to use. It was hot. Everyone and their dog was using it. And so I started using that. And then I got into Kira's because Kira's is a nice, clean, uh, higher level interface to TensorFlow. And I do a lot of teaching of neural networks. And so I find Kira's to be very helpful in that sense because the syntax is very simple and concise. And it makes building and testing and debugging neural networks really fast and easy. It's good for fast development. However, if you're familiar with the neural network uh, landscape and have been paying attention to the way the winds are blowing, uh, you would agree with me, I think, when I say that PyTorch is definitely the neural network interface, the framework that everybody's using, certainly in terms of uh, academic. Uh, research and publications in the neural network literature, PyTorch is definitely the framework that everybody's using. It's much, much more popular. It's totally overtook in tensor, overtaken TensorFlow in terms of popularity. Now, as I said, I have, uh, until this uh, comparison, I had relatively little experience with PyTorch. And so I was curious to see how these two neural networks uh, frameworks would compare in a head-to-head -to -head, uh, matchup to see, you know, uh, on a number of different metrics. In particular, I was interested in ease of implementation because ease of Im implementation um, is important to me as someone who teaches, um, and as well, the amount of code that you need, but also training time, right? How long does it take to train these things? Because that's obviously, if you're uh, doing neural networks, you're building neural networks and developing them. Um, this takes a long time and you want this thing to go quickly because you've got hyperparameters to tune. You want things to go as quickly as possible. So another couple of metrics that we're going to be looking at today is not just the amount of code that's needed to build these networks, but also how long they take to train. And another aspect that I was curious of examining is how easy is it to get your model spread across multiple GPUs? If I end up with a really big GP, uh, really big model, I want to be able to spread this across multiple GPUs, and I want to, you know, do that with as minimal pain as possible. So, in uh, in light of all that, that's the motivation for today's talk. So. Please note that I'm not going to be uh, addressing the details of neural networks in particular. I'm going to be going into this talk assuming that you have some familiarity, familiarity with neural networks, how they work, how we build them, why we go about things the way we do. I'm also going to be assuming that you know how to code in Python because all the code we'll be looking at today will be in Python. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Drop them in the chat, though. That's a little bit easier. That way, everybody can see them. And uh, we'll try to address the questions as they come along. OK. And as a side note, all the results that I'll be uh, presenting today uh, were performed on MIST, which is the uh, GPU cluster that we have at Cynet. It's a Power9 machine, uh, so a little different architecture than many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, but it's using NVIDIA GPUs um, so in that sense, the architecture will be familiar to you because we all use NVIDIA GPUs for the most part. Okay, so first, let's just do a little bit of background about neural network frameworks. So for those of you that aren't totally 
um, familiar with neural networks and how we build them, you might be wondering what, what are frameworks? He, he's been talking about frameworks. I don't know exactly what that is. Now, a neural network framework is a coding, uh, well, framework. It's an infrastructure that's been built specifically for the purpose of building neural networks. Now, the reason why we use these things is twofold. Well, the first reason we use them is because it's, it gets very error prone to do neural network development. If you're in the nitty gritty, dealing with the sizes of matrices that are being multiplied to each other and implementing back propagation by hand and all these things, it's very error prone. It's very easy to get buggy. So it's much easier to use one of these frameworks, these pieces of infrastructure that have been built specifically uh, for this type of work. So that's the first reason we use it because it just makes life so much easier. It's faster, it's less likely to get silly bugs being developed. The second reason that we use neural network frameworks, and this is a very important one, is that the neural, Python is not a high performance language. All of these neural networks are built in Python. Nobody um, does them in any other language. But as we all know, those of you that are familiar with Python and other interpreted languages, you know that Python is not a high performance language by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, there are things you can do to make things better, but as a general rule, because of the interpreter, it's gonna be a lot slower than any other language that's compiled and is running on bare metal, as we say, running straight on the CPU or the GPU directly. And this is where neural network frameworks shine because even though you're using Python to build the network, and develop the network, you're actually, the, the framework is going to take your model and it's going to compile it into a compiled language and then allow you to run that neural network, tra the training of that network and the inference of it directly on bare metal in a compiled language such as C++, for example. So the second reason we use neural network frameworks is because it's got all of this uh, compiling infrastructure built right into it. You don't have to worry about converting your model to C++. The framework's going to do it automatically. And the second thing that goes with that second point is that you can use GPUs right off the bat. Neural networks are very, very uh, good at being trained on GPUs. So if you're going down this road, if any of you are doing neural network research, uh, you definitely want to get yourself access to a GPU machine. Compute Canada, the Digital Research Alliance, excuse me, has lots of GPUs out there, and a fair number of those cycles are used for training neural networks. And the reason why is because you can get a significant speed up by training your neural network on a GPU rather than just your CPU. And again, the frameworks are specifically designed to use those resources right out of the box. So this is the second reason why we use frameworks. It allows us access to the GPUs without having to go through lots of painful coding hoops. All right, so with that uh, out of the way, let's talk about the two frameworks we're gonna talk about today. So the first framework we're gonna, I'm gonna, oh, actually the second one in the order I ended up doing it in is gonna be Kira's. Now, as I said, I've got a lot of experience with Kira's. I've been using it for a long time. It's not strictly speaking a neural network framework, and that's why I put in the abstract for today's talk, Kira's slash TensorFlow. And that's because Kira's historically was really just an API for building neural networks. And it lived on top of what were called back ends, meaning any number of different neural network frameworks could be used, and you just used Kira's as the high level interface to them. So as you can see on the slide here, there's a whole list of backends that were historically used, Theano back in the day, CNTK, MXNet, and many, many others. Kira's could be used on top of any of these backends. It didn't matter. You could just specify which one you wanted, get it installed, and Kira's would interface with it. Now, that was the historical approach. It's no longer done that way. As of um, version 2.4, Kira's has been absorbed into TensorFlow and Kira's has become sort of the main API, I think it's fair to say, 
for building neural networks in TensorFlow. You can certainly use other, other approaches, but Curis has been completely subsumed into TensorFlow at this point and is now being used as the main API for building neural networks. So if, if you're going to, if you want to try to use Curis, at this point, the easiest approach is just to install TensorFlow because Curis comes with it right away as part of the package. Now, the other framework we're going to be looking at today is uh, PyTorch. Now, I'm going to be actually using PyTorch Lightning. Now, Py, let's just talk a little bit about PyTorch. PyTorch has been around for a while, or uh, excuse me, PyTorch came from Torch. Torch has been around for a while. Torch itself is no longer actively developed. PyTorch came out uh, in the late 2000 teens. It came up from Facebook. Facebook is the main developer of PyTorch. Um, it's been rapidly, rapidly growing in popularity. Um, and in 2019, PyTorch Lightning was released. PyTorch Lightning is a wrapper that goes around PyTorch. And the purpose of PyTorch Lightning is to just um, simplify the coding of PyTorch. As I said previously, I do a lot of teaching of neural networks. And one of the reasons why I was not so thrilled about trying to teach neural networks in PyTorch is simply because it's very, very verbose. You have to write out everything. The framework has not cut any corners for you. It's all has to be spelled out explicitly. And this is where PyTorch Lightning comes in. PyTorch Lightning sort of does what Kira's does to TensorFlow, and that is that it cuts a lot of the corners for you. It makes coding it a lot simpler, a lot less verbose. Um, and it makes it a lot easier. Uh, it comes with all kinds of goodies built right into it. You can do half precision right out of the box. It actually has suggestions and diagnostics that you can use when you start running it. It says, hey, are you sure you wanna do it this way? You might consider doing this. It's really cute in that sense. Um, it has hooks to TensorBoard and it's got its own visualization capabilities available. It's got all kinds of goodies. Um, so it's not bad, uh, certainly by any means. Um, in fact, the more I have been using it, the more it's been growing on me. Um, so very, very commonly used uh, interface to PyTorch, uh, growing in popularity all the time. So those of you that use PyTorch already, I suggest you look into it. It's definitely worth looking into. Um, it doesn't take much work to switch your code over to PyTorch Lightning. Um, and we'll be going, well, you'll see the code today when we, when we go through this. Any questions so far? Uh, PyTorch has become independent from Facebook lately. Uh, I think that is true. I think that's true, um, but I'm not totally sure. Someone else will have to check that uh, for me. I have a memory in the back of my mind that that's correct. PyTorch has got, become a known ind independent uh, piece of software. It was all open source to begin with anyway. Okay, let's continue then, let's continue. So I did a bit of a lie in my abstract. Originally, when I was building the, this talk, I had intended to use the MNIST data set. Everyone who's done neural networks is familiar with the MNIST handwritten digits data set. It's like the hello world of neural networks. Everybody's used it. But as I started developing this talk and started running the tests on the different frameworks, I quickly discovered that the MNIST data set was just too small and not uh, taking enough horsepower to um, train on. And so I switched to uh, the CIFAR 10 data set instead. Those of you that aren't familiar with C the CIFAR 10 data set, it's very similar to MNIST. The main differences are, first of all, instead of having black and white images, their color. And secondly, the um, images are 32 by 32 pixels as opposed to 28 by 28. Otherwise, it's a simple uh, image classification problem, just like MNIST is. So it would be very familiar to you if you've, if you've done the MNIST problem. Instead of having 10 different digits, however, we've now got 10 different categories of image. So you can see them listed here, airplane, automobile, car, uh, or cat, dog, deer, and so on. 60,000 images, 32 by 32. It's built both into PyTorch and into Kira's because it's such a commonly used data set. Um, that uh, came out of U of T as it happens. Um, so I'm going to use that instead of MNIST. Again, the only difference between them in the, in the context of this talk is just a few numbers 
when it comes to the sizes of the images when we build the neural network um, and the size of the input data. Otherwise, it's all the same. Um, it's a very simple data set, um, perhaps a little too simple for the purposes that I had hoped to accomplish when I originally set out to build this talk. Um, in that sense, my goal was to keep things simple so that we could just you, uh, look at things that are familiar to most neural network programmers and see the differences between the frameworks. Um, however, in retrospect, it, it's possible a bigger data set, something a little more uh, intricate might have accomplished that better. Um, but I think there are still some interesting things to be seen with what, we've, what, what we'll be seeing today. Here's the neural network that we're going to be using uh, for the classification of our CIFAR data. Um, very simple. We're just going to have the incoming data. We're going to run it through a convolutional layer, followed by a max pooling layer. The first one will have 10 feature maps. We'll run it through a second convolutional layer with 20 feature maps. We'll use five by five filters for both of them. We'll run it through max pooling again. Then we'll flatten it. We'll run it through a fully connected layer. Uh, with 50 uh, neurons, followed by, uh, of course, a 10 output, uh, a 10 neuron output layer, because there are 10 categories. We'll be using RELU as our activation function for the convolutional layers and the fully connected layer. And of course, we'll be using softmax with categorical cross entropy as our loss function for the neural network um, training. So pretty simple, nothing fancy going on here. So here's sort of the roadmap for the rest of the talk. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to present the code first for PyTorch Lightning, then uh, we'll run PyTorch Lightning. So you can just see what the output looks like. So if you're not familiar with this particular framework, you can see what it looks like when it's run. Then I'm gonna present the code for Keras and we'll do the same thing. We'll just run it so you can see what the output is. Then we will look at the training, how, how quickly things trained. We'll take a little brief foray into that. After that, we'll look at how quickly, how easy it is to do multi-GPU training for both of these frameworks. We'll see that both of them are set up very nicely for that, and that it only takes the adding of a few lines of code from the original single GPU example to make it multi-GPU. And then finally, at the end of the talk, we'll look at the timing, how long things took to train under both of these frameworks and the accuracies and so on that we got. So we begin with some global variables, essentially, that we're going to be using uh, for the PyTorch Lightning side of things. This involves everything you see here is all just to uh, get the data into uh, into the machine. So first we're gonna set up some paths. This is because the data is gonna be so stored locally. We're gonna set up the batch size. This will end up being a batch size of 256 because we're gonna be training everything on GPUs for this uh, talk. We're not interested in doing CPU training for this example. Um, the device will be the um, CUDA in this particular case because we'll be using GPUs, as I said. Then we're gonna grab the data. So here I've got the Torch Vision data sets, uh, CIFAR 10 data set. You tell you where you want it, you want it to download. You're gonna grab the training data, and then we're gonna turn these to tensors so that we're ready to go. <clears throat> got a good question. Have, uh, if you want, I didn't actually post this code, um, if you want the code, I don't, I'm not going to post it right now, but if you want to go back and uh, practice with the code on your own machine, I can post the code on the class website, the, the course website um, after, after the class is done. Sorry, I didn't post it ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> once we've grabbed the data, we put it into a data loader. So this is a generator that's going to make the data available dynamically. Um, because this data set is so small, it all fits into memory of the GPU. And so this is uh, less of an issue than it would be if this were a bigger data set. Um, this is one of the reasons why I picked these smaller data sets is so that you can ignore any issues to deal with file systems, which become an issue when you're reading data 
uh, as the model is being trained. In this case, the data set can completely fit into memory. And so that's not an issue. We build our loader. We specify the batch size. We're gonna use two workers. I specify two, PyTorch could use more. I specify two simply because that was uh, what Kira's was using. So I kind of wanted to use, um, put things side by side on equal footing. Um, on MIST, there are more, certainly more than two uh, CPUs per GPU. So I could have specified something higher, um, but that's what I specified for this particular example. So that's our training data. Great, there's the testing data. It's exactly the same as the training data. The only difference is that you specify training is equal to false for this particular case. Now, of course, um, I had to run this from the login node to start so that the data would become downloaded because as with most of the machines um, with the Digital Research Alliance, the code or the uh, compute nodes do not have access to the internet. And so, um, I ran it ahead of time from the login node so that the data would become available. Then I would submit it as a job to do this properly, as we all should, as we all should. Okay, so once we've got some code that gets the data downloaded and puts it into the correct format so that it's ready to be used, we're gonna load a few uh, packages. Um, this is all standard stuff for Python, Torch, Torch Neural Network, Functional. These are all standard Torch. Um, pieces of uh, package that you need for building your neural networks and training them. Nothing particularly special here if you're used to training in Torch. I, I'm going to grab Torch Metrics. This is a little bit newer, Torch Metrics. And this is a package that contains um, the accuracy function that I'm going to be looking at uh, to see how accurate the training is as it goes along. Finally, the most interesting part, of course, of this slide is PyTorch Lightning. This is going to be the wrapper we're going to be using to um, build our network model. And it significantly um, eases the pain associated with training these things. All right, so now comes the hairy part. So this is the part about uh, PyTorch that I really don't like, and that is that you have to specify everything under the sun pretty explicitly. And that becomes apparent on this slide here, as you can see. So what we're doing here is we're building a class that's going to hold our neural network model. Uh, we start on the upper left-hand side where we initialize the class. And this is where all the layers of our model are going to be contained. We're gonna have a, two, uh, a 2D convolutional layer, it's gonna have 10 feature maps, and again, a kernel size of five, so a five by five filter on our convolutional layer. Once we um, put these all together, which we do down here in the forward step, it will go into a max pooling layer with a two by two kernel. This will be followed again by the convolutional layer, um, this time with 20 feature maps on the output. Again, another max pooling layer. We'll then flatten it and we'll run that through our fully connected layer, and this will be followed by our final output layer, which is indicated here. Great. I also initialize an accuracy function, which I'm gonna be using for um, determining the accuracy as the training goes along. And of course I need my loss function, which I'm gonna grab right here. Great. Now we have to specify the forward pass. <clears throat> which we do in the next step. So in, in comes your data, which comes in as X. We run that through our first convolutional layer, which is followed by RELU, our activation function. We then go through the first max pooling layer. Great, and then we repeat the same thing for the second combination of convolutional layer and max pooling layer, which is what we see here. Once again, through the max pooling layer, sorry, through the convolutional layer, then RELU, and then max pooling. Great. We then flatten the layer, which is what's happening here. We run that through the first fully connected layer. We run that through our ELU, and then we output through the output layer. If you're familiar with neural networks and how they're built, this should all be fairly familiar to you, I hope. I hope. Maybe not the code for PyTorch specifically, um, but everything I've been saying, the words I've been using should be pretty familiar to you. Now, when you're using PyTorch Lightning, you have to configure a bunch of other things as well as part of your class that contains the neural network model. 
First, you have to specify your optimizer. That's just a one line thing in this case. I decided to just go with straight up stochastic gradient descent, nothing fancy. We could have implemented Atom or any, any other variation of stochastic gradient descent that you like. Of course, they're all available in PyTorch. There's nothing particularly special about this. I just wanted to keep it as simple as possible. So we're gonna specify our optimizer as a stochastic gradient descent with a specified learning rate um, that I mentioned previously. Oh, we have a question. Where's the area F? F was specified back here. So it's import functional as F. That's where all your functions are for in PyTorch. <clears throat> Okay, so we've specified our optimizer. That's great. Now we have to specify our training step. What happens during training? Well, in comes our batch of data and the number of the batch, if we need that. I don't use that in this particular example. I take apart my batch data. I run the forward problem through the model. And then I calculate both the cost function and the accuracy. And then I return both. Great. Now that's gonna happen for each epic, uh, or excuse me, each batch, not each epic, each batch within the epic. And then when the epic's done, you can specify special functions you like to do special things if you want to. In this particular case, I like to see what's going on um, with my model. And so I'm gonna print out some output here. I'm gonna calculate the accuracy. I'm gonna calculate the loss, and then I'm going to print both. And then I'm also going to log it to a file so I can grab it later. In this particular example, um, by default, PyTorch Lightning is going to use TensorBoard as its interface. So you can watch your model train in TensorBoard if you like. I'm not a huge fan of TensorBoard. It certainly has advantages over some uh, visualization interfaces for a training a neural network. Um, some people really like it. It's certainly not bad, but it's, it's not my favorite. But in any case, the hooks are built into PyTorch Lightning, so you're ready to go uh, right off the bat. Questions about our implementation? <clears throat> okay. Okay, so let's carry on then. Once you've built your model, or sorry, you've built the class which will contain your model, you initialize it which is going, what's going on here. I initialize my model, great. Now this is the part where PyTorch Lightning really shines, this chunk of code right here in the main body. With a normal PyTorch training loop, you actually have to do the looping explicitly, right? Those of you that are familiar with PyTorch know this, you have to do a for loop and then write out all the steps explicitly. But PyTorch Lightning says, no, 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 that's, that's a pain. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna initialize a trainer and then we're going to uh, put all the goodies into that trainer that we need. So we're gonna specify the accelerator that we want now I specified auto here, so it will automatically detect which uh, accelerators are available. You don't have to do that. If you know that you've got a GPU available, you can just specify a GPU as the accelerator you want to use. Um, but I think it's kind of cool to use auto, so I used it for this particular example. Specify how many epics you want to train. Um, I turned off the progress bar, and that's simply because I, uh, again, I was running this on MIST, and I was submitting uh, batch jobs to do this training. And when you've got batch jobs, if you have a progress bar, the output becomes all garbled because you've got all these progress bar squares showing up in your output. It gets hard to read. So I turned that off, and I also specify the number of GPUs. Now, as I said, we're going to be doing a multi-GPU example in a few slides towards the end of the talk. Um, but for this uh, starting example, I decided to use just a single GPU um, so we can all see how it's done. Finally, once, once you've specified your trainer, uh, you just fit it. So you specify the model, which we initialized up here, and we specify the data. And that's the... the um, data loader that we specified a few slides ago. So you specify that, give it to the trainer, off it goes. And then once that's done, I specify the test. I didn't put my testing functions in, in the slides. 
for this example, um, simply to save space. They're very similar to the training functions. Again, you have to specify them inside the class that you build to hold your model. Um, but again, they're, they're just doing very similar things to the training. Once we've done that, we run our model and there's not much to it. Because the data is built into uh, PyTorch, it'll just go grab it, download it, and off it goes. So I do Python after I've been, you know, I've built my virtual environment, of course, <clears throat> and then initialized it, and off I go. So Python, run lightnings, CFAR 10, and off it goes. Now, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to look for accelerators. This is kind of cool. So not only is it going to look for GPUs, which, you know, we would all expect, it also looks for TPUs and IPUs. And I think there's something that's one of the times I ran it looked for an HPU. I don't even know what an HPU is. Uh, TPU, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a, a tensor processing unit. This is one of Google's uh, special chips for running neural networks. IPU is uh, intelligence processing unit. This is another chip built by a different company. I can't remember what it is. Um, so anyway, it's looking for accelerators. Uh, got a question and I don't see where you specify which part of the data is used for training, which is for testing. That's back here. Let's just back up so you can see that's right here. So at the bottom of this slide, I specify the training data here and then the testing data here. And the only difference between these two blocks of commands is this flag right here, right? Train equals true, train equals false. Mm. So it'll automatically download the two uh, blocks of data pre-separated, it's ready to go. Does that make sense? Okay. Off we go. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. I, I, are you saying that the training and the test parts are automatically are already defined in the data set? Correct. Correct. Wow. Oh, cool. Thank you. No problem. OK. Now, so the first thing PyTorch Lightning is going to do is it's going to auto detect its accelerators. Great. Then it's going to automatically print out a summary of your model. <laughs> this is great. I prefer that myself. Um, it's nice to see. So again, you can see we've got our First convolutional layer, the number of parameters that are in it, our max pooling layer, second convolutional layer, and then we flatten and we've got our first fully connected layer and then our output. It specifies the loss and the accuracy that we're using. And we've got about 31,000 free parameters that we're gonna be training. So a pretty small model as these sorts of things go. Okay, so carrying on, it's going to train, it's going to train, and then it's going to, as it does so, it's going to print out the things that I asked it to at the end of each epoch. So because I turned off the progress bar, the normal output would that would be um, generated is not going to be generated in this particular case, but instead um, it's going to output the stuff that I asked for. So epoch zero, and then the loss, and then the accuracy, and down and down and down it goes. And then finally, the testing accuracy which we see is about 62%. Now, I don't want you to get too hung up on the accuracies that are being generated for the examples I'm going to be presenting today. And the main reason for that is because, first of all, this is not going to be state of the art for this data set by any means. If you want to do state of the art um, for the CIFAR 10 data set, you want to be using one of the ResNet models, ResNet 18, for example, or one of the higher ones. Those will get you up past 95%. The purpose, again, of today's talk is to look more at how easy is it to implement this and then how fast does it train? This gives us a better sense overall of how these models are going to be uh, trainable and implementable as opposed to the accuracy itself. So again, we see about 74% on the training data and 62%. So a little bit of overfitting going on already, we can see. Not a big deal though. I'm not too worried about the accuracies for the sake of this talk. I include them in the summary slide at the end for completeness. I don't wanna be hiding anything, um, but I'm not too, too concerned about the numbers. Okay. We've built our PyTorch Lightning model and we've trained it. It's that simple. It wasn't that bad overall. Um, but as we'll see with Kiras, Kiras is a lot 
leaner when it comes to code. A lot more is assumed. Things happen a lot more under the hood. So I'm going to begin the same way with my Kira's code as I did with the PyTorch Lightning code. And that is I'm going to set up the loading of my data. In this particular case, I'm also going to be grabbing all my packages right now because there's a lot less code with Kira's. I figured I'd just put my package loading on this slide instead of waiting till later. So I'm going to grab all the pieces of Kira's. You'll notice that it's part of TensorFlow, as I said previously. So when you're importing your Kira's uh, sub packages, you're going to be going through TensorFlow to do it. This is the normal way it's done now. So import TensorFlow, this, that, and the other thing. Then I'm going to build a generator for my data. This is generally a good idea. Um, this is why we did it with PyTorch Lightning. It's also a good idea with TensorFlow. Now, again, as I said previously, because the data is going to be all in memory, because the data set is so small, it's not extremely critical for the example we're looking at today. But as a general rule, it's a good idea to build a generator for your data sets, especially if you're doing something big, like you're working on ImageNet or something else that has hundreds of thousands or millions of images, and especially if it's reading the data from disk as the training's going on, you definitely want to have a generator set up to help deal with your bottlenecks. <clears throat> so Keeb's got a question. Is the generator here performing the same function as the data loader? Yes, exactly. As in the exa last example, it's building a generator. So here, what we're doing is I, I um, it's going to, the data is going to come in data, which is your uh, X data, the incoming images, and then the labels are the targets. And then you specify a batch size. And the generator here is just going to loop through them. And then, of course, use yield, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's going to yield. And then um, it's going to scale the data by 255 and then convert to one hot encoding, which you have to do explicitly in Keras, which you, you don't have to do in PyTorch Lightning. The categorization step in PyTorch Lightning is actually a little cleaner than in Keras. You don't have to do the one hot encoding. And you may have noticed that I didn't actually specify my um, activation function on my output layer for my lightning, my PyTorch lightning example. And that's because it's built into the cost function. You don't actually have to do it in PyTorch lightning. Here we do though. So you'll see it when we build our model on the next slide. So I'm gonna convert this to categorical and then that's my generator function. And then I'm gonna build a data set from generator using that function. So the gen function, which we defined right here. And then you specify the shapes of the output, types and shapes. Oh my goodness, I apologize. I didn't update that from the MNIST data. That should say 32 by 32, not 28 by 28. So I knew there'd be an error in there and I found it. Good job, good job. And then once that's done, you return the batch. So you're good to go. Excellent. Okay. Now, let's build our model. Now, I personally almost never build my models in Kira's inside a class. You can do it just like we did with MNIT or with PyTorch Lightning, excuse me. You can certainly do it, um, but I never really find the need to. It's a lot cleaner in my personal opinion to not put it inside a class. So here I'm creating a function. I'm gonna specify the number of feature maps and that we'll use in our two convolutional layers. And then I'm also going to specify the number of nodes that we're going to use in our fully connected layer. The output shape, of course, is going to be 32 by 32 by three, or excuse me, the input shape. And then the output size is going to be 10 because we, again, we have 10 categories. So we'll have 10 neurons on our output layer. Great. Now, those of you that are familiar with Kira's will recognize what's happening here. It's all pretty straightforward. Um, unlike the um, PyTorch Lightning example that I did, where I had to specify the layers and then I specify how they're used, here you just specify how they're used right away, right, as you build them. So first we create an empty model. <laughs> to that model, we then add a convolutional layer, a 2D convolutional layer. We specify the number of feature maps, which will be 10 when we call this function to initialize the model. 
We specify that our kernel size is five by five, just with the previous model. We specify the activation function. And of course, because it's the first layer in our model, we have to specify the input shape, which of course is 32 by 32 by three. <clears throat> Once we've done that, we add our second layer, our 2D max pooling. Again, two by two, stride of two by two. So we're doing the usual, same thing we did with the previous model with PyTorch Lightning. And then we repeat the same thing over again. This time we're going to have twice as many feature maps in our convolutional layer. So we're going to have 20 this time. Same uh, size of filter. So it's going to be five by five. We don't have to specify the input shape because we know uh, Kira's now knows how big the incoming data is for that layer. But again, we specify RELU as our activation function. And again, we add our max pooling layer. Great. Now we flatten our data. We add our fully connected layer, which will have 50 nodes when we actually call this thing, call the function which will build this model. And again, the activation functions are ELU. And then finally, we come to our output layer, output size of 10, activation function soft max, of course, because this is a categorization problem. We're going to use soft max as the activation function for the output layer categorical cross entropy for the cost function. <clears throat> okay, very good, very good. Now we've built our model or we haven't built our model. We've built a function which generates our model and now off we go. So we specify the number of epochs and the learning rate. Again, we'll specify a batch size of 256. We grab our data. We pass that data into the function which builds our generators. So again, the CIFAR data in Kira is just like the CIFAR data in PyTorch comes pre-split into training and testing data. So you don't need to separate it yourself. We build our generators. We build our model, which holds our neural network. We compile the model. So here's a step that uh, PyTorch does not do explicitly the way it doesn't care is here we specify our loss function and our um, optimization algorithm so rather than putting into inside an object as we did um, with pytorch lightning here we're going to specify it in a special compiling step so we specify once again stochastic gradient descent we specify the learning rate as we did um, we specify in this case accuracy and this what this is is simply the output that we want to see when this thing trains and then finally we specify the loss function that we're going to be using categorical cross entropy because this is a categorization problem excellent and then we just do model.fit you give it the data you specify the number of epics and you specify the batch size i put verbose equals two i like to see what's going on other people will choose different level levels of verbosity depending on their taste Great, and then we'll print the output on the testing data when we run this thing. Excellent, okay, so let's do it. So once again, we're on the MIST. I don't actually have to do this on the MIST login node because it, um, unlike um, PyTorch Lightning, which is going to try to download the data locally um, to the specific directory that it's running in, uh, Kira's will download it to your home directory. So I've already pre-run this um, so that it will download it to my home directory. So this would be inside a batch job. Uh, normally, I wrote it out here just for clarity. Python run Kira's CFAR 10 and off it goes. It runs for 300 epics. And finally, we get an accurate final accuracy of about 82%. So a little higher than PyTorch, but a lower accuracy on the test data for this particular example. Questions about the Kira's implementation. So that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now sorry, sorry, can I I know I'm supposed to type it in the chat, but oh good. Go ahead. I asked before about splitting it into training and testing. Yes, and I, and I apparently misunderstood the answer because here you're you are explicitly deciding specifying how to split it. 
No, no, it comes from this function. So you see it right here. This load data function returns two tuples. And within each of those tuples are the uh, input data and the targets for both the training and the testing. Okay, so what are the 10 and the 20 in the next? 10 and, sorry, 10 and 20. Uh, oh, where, what is that? Let me back up here. I've forgotten already. Um, sorry, I'm, one more, one more. Batch size, there it is. Oh. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Mm. Other questions, that's good. Okay, so now, just out of curiosity, I wanted to see how these two models compared side by side. I ran them for 300 epics, and you can see the accuracy of the two models as a function of epic here. Um, clearly, Kira's is training faster. <clears throat> Um, I'm not totally sure why that is. Um, these two models should be the same, but as you can see, one is training faster than the other. A possibility, which I haven't explored, may have to do with the normalization of the data, which I did at the beginning of Kira's, but it did not explicitly do for the PyTorch Lightning example. Um, that just occurred to me a few minutes before the talk. I hadn't in all the examples that I'd seen, no one had ever normalized the data. And so I had assumed that it wasn't necessary, but that may not be true. <clears throat> this PyTorch does deduce this because it's a categorization problem. Exactly, Wooter. You don't have to specify the output on the, um, on the, uh, the activation function on the output layer, correct. So we can see right away that uh, Kira's is training faster, and I'm not sure why that is. I haven't explained this particular anomaly. If anyone has any suggestions, I'm very curious. My guess is that I didn't normalize the data and that it actually did matter. Um, you can see it's still training pretty quickly. It does a good job. Um, but certainly, why do they start at different accuracies? The different accuracies are simply a function of the fact that it's been um, initialized randomly, right? The neural network is just initialized randomly. So the very beginning step, don't uh, worry too, too much about the initial accuracy, that's normal. The default SGD parameters should be the same because I specified the learning rate. That's a good question, James. I did specify the learning rate and if it's straight up vanilla SGD, if the batch size is the same, it should be the same algorithm at least as I understand straight up stochastic gradient descent. There's not much to it. The only parameter is the learning rate. Learning rate is static. So it should be the same. Oh, sorry, not James, Jacques, Jacques. Anyway, an interesting point. Again, I'm not too, too um, concerned about this. What about the initialization of the weights? That's a good question. I did not look into how these weights are being initialized. It's I know that in Kira's you can explicitly specify the distribution from which the weights are initialized so you can have more control over how things are initialized. Um, I don't know if they're being initialized from the same distributions. That's a good question. That's something worth looking into. It's not growing as, as swiftly. It's almost linear at this point, right? It's almost linear. So once or once you get over the initial curve. What's the th three? Three, that's the input, the number of input channels. So you specify the number of in input channels and output channels for the uh, COMP2D function. So the incoming data is three colors, right? So that's, that's why the first one has a three there. All right, let's push forward. Now, before we look at the timing data, which I think is the most interesting part of, the, of this talk, let's just do a quick review of what code needs to be changed to make this multi-GPU. I was actually quite pleased at how little needs to be adapted. Um, I, uh, I changed two pieces of code inside my PyTorch Lightning um, object when I changed this to multi-GPU. The first thing was in the training step, I decided I wanted to return both the 
data, the target data and the predicted data. And you'll see why in just a second. This was simply for the uh, convenience of calculating the accuracy because uh, before I go over the code, I'll just explain what the problem was. The problem was that if I have two GPUs, I only did this for two GPUs. One, because it's a pretty small problem to begin with, and this isn't really appropriate to spread over two GPUs, but I did anyway. Um, if you've got two GPUs and you ask it what the accuracy is, you write the code, you will get two outputs, the accuracy on GPU zero and the accuracy on GPU one. That's all well and good, but I'm more interested in the, the combined accuracy, right? The accuracy of the full data set. And so to do that, you need to keep track of how many data are on each one and how many you got right on each GPU. And that's why I am now outputting both the targets and the predicted values for those targets. So now if you come to the def training epic end function, which is the function that's run after the epic is finished, I'm going to create a, a tensor, 10 by 10 tensor. This is essentially going to build a confusion matrix. If you're familiar with classification problems and how they're studied, and how they're evaluated, you'll be familiar with a confusion matrix. It just indicates um, which values that are predicted correspond to which values which, that are correct. A good confusion matrix will have a strong diagonal, high, high values on the diagonal, and not so many values on the off diagonals. That indicates that if, if it's predicted to be category two, it actually was category two. And so it ended up on the diagonal in that case. So I'm gonna create an empty uh, tensor that's 10 by 10. And then I'm going to uh, um, populate it for each GPU. So you have to think in terms of parallel coding here, all of the code you see here is gonna be run on both GPUs now. I'm going to initialize an empty tensor, I'm going to calculate, populate that tensor for on both GPUs, and then I'm going to reduce it. And that's the step that's happening here. I'm going to take both of the tensors. If you're familiar with MPI, this is just a reduction operation. We're just going to take both tensors and add them to each other on the zeroth GPU. That's what's happening right here. That's why zero is specified. I'm going to reduce the, there it is, zero. I'm going to reduce both tensors on top of each other on the zero with GPU. And then I'm going to use that to calculate the accuracy on both of them. But at the end of the day, I'll only print it out for the zero with GPU. I'll then do a similar thing for the loss. I'm gonna add up the loss and then reduce that as well so that I can get the total loss across both GPUs. Do these... Uh, question do these changes apply to multi gpu multi node settings i haven't looked at multi node settings yet so i don't know the answer that's a good question multi nodes a bit different yeah I, I figured it would be a little bit different just because now we've got to communicate off device right finally i'm going to check for the zero with gpu that's what this flag is doing here each GPU is going to either be zero or not zero in the hierarchy of GPUs. If it's the zero with GPU, which is what this uh, conditional is asking, then it's gonna print out my totals and log it. So we can see that only the zero with GPU is both gonna be printing stuff out and in this case, doing the logging, hence this last flag here. Writing the differences you're gonna there's a division by 255. I don't see the normalization. No, you're not missing something. That could be the cause of the of the training rate difference. Um, I just realized that before the talk today that I didn't normalize the data in the PyTorch implementation. So that could be the cause. <clears throat> I'm not sure. At the end of the day, I'm not too worried about the speed of the training or the accuracy. Again, because we see serious overfitting, we know that this model probably is not appropriate for this data set anyway, or at least the way it's been implemented. You might want to consider adding some dropout that might help with the overfitting issue, um, or perhaps just 
start um, modifying the data using some of the uh, image generation um, generators that are out there. Um, so that could be the cause. That's something I need to go back and double check for this talk, should I give it again. Thank you for the question though, that's good. Now, we made a, a small adjustment to the object that contains the class that contains our model uh, to do multi GPU training with um, PyTorch Lightning. One other adjustment that needs to be made is I'm going to specify now my accelerator to be DDP. That stands for distributed data parallel. So we're going to be doing data parallelism as opposed to model parallelism for our GPUs. If you're not familiar with that, what that means is that we're gonna have the same model copied onto both GPUs, and then we'll be training with different sets of data on each GPU. And then after each um, iteration, the weights and biases of the models will be updated across the GPUs. So this is called data uh, parallelism as opposed to model parallelism, which is the opposite, as you might imagine. It's where you chop up your model and spread that across different GPUs. Um, and then they both have access to the same data set, presumably, or variations thereof. So we're gonna specify DDP as our accelerator, and then I'm gonna specify the number of GPUs. And that's it. That's all you have to do to um, spread across multiple GPUs. Of course, you're gonna need, when you submit this job, to your, the scheduler, you'll have to specify how many GPUs you want and so forth and so on. And these things need to coordinate between the code and the scheduler, but nonetheless, it is that simple to get uh, data parallelism working uh, with PyTorch Lightning. So that's, that's pretty slick, that's pretty slick. This has come a long way since um, the early days when we had neural network frameworks and multiple GPUs. Forget multi-node, <laughs> it's just multiple GPUs in general. All right, very good. So now we're going to carry on. We're going to look at Kira's for multi GPU. Again, I was pleasantly surprised how easy this was. I've never used uh, Kira's with multi, uh, multiple GPUs. So when I started looking into this just to see how difficult the implementation was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised at how easy it is. So here I'm going to specify a, a distribution strategy using TensorFlow. So I'm going to specify a strategy. In this particular case, again, I'm going to be using what's called a mirrored strategy. So that means, again, data parallelism, where you've got the same model mirrored, as it's called, mirrored on multiple GPUs with different sets of data. And then, excuse me, when I uh, initialize my strategy, um, excuse me, initialize my model, I'm now going to do it under the scope of that strategy. So I initialize my model, same as before, but under with strategy.scope. And then I do the compilation under that strategy as well. Once that's done, I just proceed as, as, as before. So I fit my model. I don't have to be inside the strategy anymore. And then I print out the results. All right, very good, very good. So let us look at the results. So this is my summary slide both accuracy and timing. Now, what I wanna draw your attention to is this first column here. Um, so I was getting 22 seconds per epic under Kira's under a single GPU, but I was not getting that on lightning. Holy smokes, um, kind of blew it away. So it took me an hour 42 to train on a single GPU with Kira's and it took, what is it, 18 minutes under PyTorch Lightning. So significantly faster with PyTorch Lightning. I, like I said, I don't have a lot of experience with PyTorch, but I'm gonna start seriously considering it now because this is, as you can see, the, the uh, timing numbers just, well, PyTorch blew it away, right? Kira's TensorFlow didn't stand a chance. The accuracies are different. As I mentioned, that may have to do with the initialization of the data. Um, and again, on two GPUs, I put, again, I put the numbers here. They're almost the same for Kira's and they're slightly longer for PyTorch Lightning. Again, this is more a function, I think, of the fact that the data set is so small um, that it's not even worth the effort to, to do multi-GPU. Again, I only put the numbers here 
simply because uh, I wanted to be completely transparent in what my numbers were. So I wouldn't recommend doing multi-GPU on a problem this small. Obviously, you would definitely need a bigger data set. Or in fact, I try to squeeze it onto one GPU for as long as you can, only uh, spread it over two GPUs um, once you can just no longer fit either the model or the data or both onto your GPU. Uh, the neural networks are overfitting the data. Um, again, this is more a function of the network. It has nothing to do with the framework so much. Um, and again, the, the problem is really too small to do multi-GPU training. Um, but again, I was just doing it as an exercise for this talk. So in summary, um, there's definitely less code for Keras. Um, it's a lot more compact. PyTorch Lightning and PyTorch in general, especially PyTorch has more code. PyTorch Lightning has less code than PyTorch does, but still more than Keras. Um, ease of parallelization, easy for both of them. Just a few quick modifications to the code to get it to parallelize. So that was not a big deal. Um, but hands down, Lightning just blew TensorFlow out of the water when it came to the speed of training on a single GPU. Um, so that might be your takeaway message for, from this talk. If you need one message, um, uh, PyTorch really um, was very fast. It was very, I always knew it was a fast framework. I didn't realize how fast it is on MIST anyway. <clears throat> updated on, uh, how are the weights updated when you're doing data parallelism? You know, I don't know. It might be done through the CPU. Does someone else know the answer to that? Do you know how the weights are updated when you're doing data parallelism? Um, uh, in industry, that's a great question. I don't know which is more common in industry. I get the sense that TensorFlow is more common in industry. Um, but that will obviously change once academia gets dominated by a particular framework. Um, almost certainly, eventually industry will catch up with it. Um, can you briefly show where you'd implement early stopping in PyTorch? In, early stopping will be set up as part of a, a callback. Um, I didn't go into callbacks just because um, I had enough going on here. Um, but you would specify the callback as part of your trainer. So I can do that quickly. Um, let's just go back up here. So right here, I'm building my trainer. So to specify a callback, I would do it um, uh, before I specify the trainer. After I specify my model, I would say, you know, I, I would specify my callback, whatever it happens to be. And you can specify early stopping as a callback. And then you would specify that as part of your trainer. So then you would uh, do comma callbacks equals, and then you specify as many callbacks as you want. That's where it would be done. <clears throat> NCLL collective calls. Okay, that's good. Makes more sense. Okay. Um, does the training speed difference come when PyTorch uses half precision? I didn't, Gong, I didn't specify half precision here. So I'm assuming that it was using full precision, not half. You could, you can specify half precision, but I didn't turn that on. I don't think that's the default, is it? Um, I'm going to assume it's not. If it is, that could totally explain it. Um, That precision is not default. That's what I would, I would assume full precision would be default. So any other questions quickly? I'm getting told to wrap things up here. So um, if there aren't, um, thanks everybody. It's been a pleasure and I hope you found it useful. Thanks guys.